Welcome students to um, the first of a couple of lectures on the detailed markings on the axial and appendicular skeletons um, from exercises 9 and 10 in your lab manual. Um, we're going to start with the axial skeleton and we're actually going to um, start with the skull. Um, so in a previous lecture we went over the bones of the skull, but now we want to look at what we call the sutures, which are essentially these kind of fibrous little connective tissue joints um, that will connect all of the cranial bones. Um, so the sagittal suture is the what connects the right and left parietal bones. The frontal or coronal suture connects the parietal bones to the frontal bone. The squamous suture connects the um, parietal bone to the temporal bone on both sides of the skull. And then in the back, connecting the occipital bone to the parietal bone is the lambdoid suture. Um, it looks like a Greek letter lambda, so lambdoid suture it is. And then connecting the occipital bone to the temporal bone is the occipitomastoid suture. This marking right here happens to be the mastoid process on the temporal bone, um, so occipito mastoid, connecting the occipital to the temporal bones. If we look at markings on the frontal and parietal bones, on uh, the frontal bone, um, we're talking about the supraorbital foramen here. Um, so you have two foramina, one over each eye socket, um, and it is essentially an opening for um, blood vessels and nerves to um, kind of escape the, the skull and um, get out into the the kind of uh, more superficial tissues. On the parietal bone, we're really just talking about the, the, the sutures. Um, there aren't, because it's basically just the top of your skull, um, so there aren't really many markings beyond the sutures connecting it to other cranial bones. If we look underneath the skull, we're looking here at the underside of the occipital bone. We've got the lambdoid suture, again, connecting it to the parietal bone, but underneath is where we find most of our markings for the occipital bone. One of the big ones, of course, is the foramen magnum here. This is how your spinal cord gets out of your brain. <coughs> and then on either side of the uh, foramen magnum are the occipital condyles where your skull then connects to the first of your vertebra. If we look at the temporal bone, um, we can look at the squamous suture up here, the zygomatic process, which uh, makes up part of the arch for your cheekbones, um, kind of just underneath the zygomatic process, just a little bit behind and underneath, is the mandibular fossa. It's this uh, very shallow little dip in the temporal bone um, where your mandible attaches for your TMJ, your joint jaw your jaw joint, excuse me, um, and then just um, kind of posterior to that, we've got the external acoustic meatus, which is the canal that leads to your eardrum, um, so it's part of your ability to hear. Um, down here, we've got the styloid process, um, which is the skinnier one, and the mastoid process, which are, is the blunter um, of the two processes. Um, these are attachment points for um, some neck muscles, some um, chewing muscles. I'm actually going to go back, for instance, in the previous image because if you then look on the underside of the skull again uh, and look at the underside of the temporal bone you'll see two passageways for some really important nerves and blood vessels. Um, the rounder of the two is the carotid canal. Um, this is where your carotid arteries descend into your skull uh, in order to supply blood to your brain. And then just posterior to them, you have these wider ones, uh, these wider um, foramen um, for um, the jugular vein to descend out of the brain and bring the kind of used blood back to the heart. Um, so those are all of the kind of various markings on the temporal bone that you should be able to identify and give me a little blurb about what they do. If we look at the sphenoid bone, um, this is a really complicated looking bone. It's very complex. It's got that kind of bat or butterfly shape to it. Uh, it sits uh, in the skull 
uh, making up kind of some of the base of the skull. It also makes up some of the back walls of the, the eye sockets. Um, and the sphenoid bone is considered the cranial bone keystone, meaning all of the other cranial bones connect to the sphenoid bone um, somewhere. So all of the other cranial bones, the occipital bone, the temporal bones, etc., cetera, et cetera, all of them connect to the sphenoid bone, um, in part because of its very complicated shape. Um, so the greater wings here um, are what actually do make up the kind of back of your eye socket orbits, um, and also, as you can kind of see here in purple, make up some of the base of the skull. The lesser wings support the frontal lobe of your brain, um, and they will have two tiny little holes in them. They're a little hard to see in these figures. Um, but that is where you will find the optic canals um, for passage of your optic nerve from your brain out to your eyeball so that you can see. Um, we also have these orbital fissures here. Um, these are much wider holes kind of between the greater and lesser wings, um, which are uh, passageways for a uh, a bunch of your cranial nerves um, that allow you to do a whole host of things. Um, sticking down from the bottom of the sphenoid bone, which you can actually see if you look on the, not the underside of the, well it is sort of the underside, but if you look at the kind of the back side of the, the jaw, that is where you'll see these pterygoid processes, um, and they are attachment points for some of our chewing muscles. The body of this sphenoid is known as the cella tersica. It means Turk's saddle. And so if you look at it, it looks uh, somewhat saddle-shaped. Saddle um, and that is the housing for your pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland kind of sits in that little saddle. If we look at the deepest of our skull bones, the ethmoid bone, which sits here kind of above the nasal cavity, um, kind of making up... Um, kind of the behind the nose, um, you'll see that um, the perpendicular plate here um, makes up the superior part of your nasal septum, um, what separates your um, kind of nasal cavity into a right and left. Um, it's the medial walls of the orbits, these lateral masses, um, and this point sticking up, um, which you can actually see if you open up the top of the skull and look towards the front, you'll see this little point sticking up. Um, this is known as the Christogalli, um, which is uh, the cox comb. You know how little cocks have those little combs that stick up off their heads? Um, and this is where your brain actually attaches to your skull. Um, and then on either side of the Christogalli is the cribiform plate. Um, and in that cribiform plate, um, you will find lots and lots of uh, little tiny foramina uh, for all of your olfactory nerves so that you can smell. If we look at the bones of the face, um, if we look at the two jaw bones, the lower mandible and the upper maxillae, um, the kind of thrusting portion of the mandible is the mandibular body. That's really like your chin. The mandibular ramus here is an extension of that body. And then the mandibular ramus ends up with two processes separated by a notch. The back process is the mandibular condyle or the condylar process. And this is where your lower jaw will connect with the mandibular fossa on the temporal bone to make your temporal mandibular joint. The front process is the coronoid process, and it is an attachment point for one of your chewing muscles, the temporalis. And then the notch just separates the two, um, allows nerves and blood vessels um, to kind of move in and around the body. Um, in terms of um, uh, the maxillae, um, if you look towards the back of the maxillae, if you flip it over um, and look at the underside of the maxilla, um, you'll see the anterior two-thirds of that maxilla are known as the palatine processes, and they make up the, the first two-thirds of your hard palate. Um, the maxillae are the keystone bones for your face, so all of your facial bones will connect to the maxillae. Um,
if we look at, um, if we kind of get out of the face there um, and then move into um, the vertebral column, we're going to start with just um, some general kind of structures on a vertebra. Um, we've got the vertebral foramen here um, in the center, that's the hole. Um, that is where your spinal cord kind of passes through um, on its way down the body. Um, anteriorly, we've got the big body or centrum of the vertebra, and then the spinous processes pointing down are towards the back. You will see um, both superiorly and inferiorly you will see facets um, so the uh, um, the facet is the um, kind of flat surface this is where the uh, vertebrae will connect to each other um, on the sides you'll see the transverse processes uh, which are muscle attachment points um, and then the arch of the vertebra is made up of the lamina which is this portion here the pedicle which are these here kind of holding up the articular facets and then the the spinous process in the back one of the things um, that make um, the C1 and C2 vertebra very different is that they have some of the similar features to um, kind of like a typical vertebra, but then they have um, a couple of really, really different features. For one, the C1 vertebra, which is known as the atlas, has no body and no spinous process. Um, Instead, it has kind of two arches, an anterior arch and a posterior arch, and then these two lateral masses with these superior articular facets where the C1 atlas vertebra will connect to the occipital condyles. Um, and that is how you are then able to nod your head um, so that you can kind of say yes, yes, yes when you're nodding your head. Um, the C1 vertebra is known as the atlas vertebra because um, the C1 holds up the kind of globe of your skull and the titan atlas holds up the globe of the earth in Greek mythology. Um, so it kind of makes sense for C1 to be atlas. The C2 vertebra is known as the axis vertebra um, in large part because of this structure right here, which is the dens, which is um, this projection that projects into the atlas and almost acts like the missing body of the axis of the atlas and it is a pivot point um, so the axis and the atlas well the atlas really kind of rotates around the dens here on the axis um, so that you can shake your head no and so since it's rotating on the axis it's the axis vertebra. So C1, atlas, C2, axis. Very, very, very different vertebra um, compared to all of the other different, all of the other vertebrae. You do want to be able to identify um, where in the vertebral column a particular vertebra comes from. Um, so there are, um, you'll see some differences like right away, shape um, of the, um, spinous processes, the shape of the vertebral foramen, size, yes, the cervical vertebra are much smaller than the lumbar vertebra, but you can't really go just on size because, say, the smallest of the lumbar vertebra and the largest of the thoracic vertebra are going to be fairly similar in size, but we can make some other comparisons. Um, so, for instance, the cervical vertebra, their transverse processes have foramina in them for the carotid arteries to go from the heart up to the head and the brain. Um, and you'll only see them on the cervical vertebra. The spinous process on a cervical vertebra is what we call bifid or bifurcated. Basically, it means it is um, forked like a, a snake's tongue. The vertebral foramen is somewhat egg-shaped, whereas on the thoracic vertebra, the vertebral foramen is very, very round. Um, no more transverse foramina. The thoracic vertebra will also have costal facets for our ribs, where the ribs attach, because they're the only vertebrae that have attachment points to ribs. 
And their spinous processes are um, kind of the, the sharpest and the, the, almost the pointiest of the vertebrae. Conversely, the lumbar vertebrae have these very kind of blunt, um, kind of hatchet-shaped processes. They almost look like the head of an ax. Um, their vertebral foramen um, are kind of more egg-shaped again and not as round as the thoracic vertebra. Um, so you do want to be able to um, look at a vertebra and kind of tell where in the skeleton it, where in the vertebral column it happens to be coming from. If we look at the thoracic cage um, on the sternum, we've got the manubrium, the sternal body, and the xiphoid process. On the manubrium, we've got this jugular notch at the top um, in order for the jugular veins to travel up and descend from the head. You've got two clavicular notches on either side where the clavicles will attach to the sternum. On the body of the sternum, we've got facets for the costal cartilages. Um, and then the xiphoid process, um, as I think I mentioned in an earlier lecture, is mostly cartilaginous tissue until we're uh, in our 50s. Um, and then it will finally ossify. When we look at the ribs, um, not only do we want to be able to say, hey, is this a true rib, false rib, floating rib, but we want to be able to identify the head, neck, and shaft of the rib. The head is where it connects to the costal facets on the vertebra. The neck is kind of this skinnier portion that then leads into the shaft of the vertebra where it will then um, connect with some costal cartilage in order to go to the sternum. Lastly, I want to talk about the fetal skull. Um, so fetal skulls have bones that are not totally fused. Um, so it still has the overall general shape of an adult skull, um, but you'll be able to see these kind of fibrous fontanelles, which are essentially just remnants of um, the membranous tissue that at one point made up the whole of the fetal skull. Um, the purpose of the fontanelles is twofold. One, it allows the skull to compress during childbirth, right? Just kind of make it out through the birth canal. And then it also allows for really, really rapid brain growth. Um, uh, late, late, late in development, fetal brain growth is quite exponential. Um, and so by having the bones not totally fused, um, as the brain grows in size, the fetal skull is able to keep up with it. There are four fontanelles. The anterior fontanelle at the top, which is the baby's soft spot. It is the very last fontanelle to close. Um, it connects the parietal and frontal bones. We've got the sphenoidal fontanelle here between the parietal, frontal, and temporal bones. We have the mastoid fontanelle back here um, between the temporal, parietal, and occipital bones. And then not visible he here, but um, towards the back between the parietal and occipital bones, you have then a posterior fontanelle. Um, you do want to make sure you take a look at the fetal skull in the lab, um, but please do be careful with it as it is um, quite fragile. We will look at the appendicular skeleton in another lecture um, so that this file doesn't get completely and ridiculous in terms of size.